generation markets. So today we're looking at the household sector. Uh, next week we'll be looking at community grids and then schools. We have a section devoted to municipalities. And the final seminar, I'll be chatting with a player who has navigated the C&I space and is currently one of the applicants for one of three energy trading licenses. So I'm hoping that today will be so scintillating that you'll join us and you'll sign up for those seminars. A very special word of welcome to our three presenters, uh, Mr. Ross Main shirt uh, of Versify, Mark Duplessis of Standard Bank, and uh, Mr. Derek Kaufman of Anderson South Africa. I do want to disclose that I have institutional uh, or a personal relationship with all of these speakers. Um, I am a Versify customer. I'm a longtime client of Standard Bank because my aunt, who is now almost 90, made us open bank accounts at Standard Bank when we were 12 years old. And I am from time to time provide ESG advice to Anderson South Africa. And Derek and I are also CrossFitters, dedicated CrossFitters. So that's by the way of disclosure. Uh, but thank you so much for making the time to be here. I know it's in the middle of the working day. Um, these are billable hours, working hours. So thank you so much for the time um, also in presenting and preparing for the seminar today. So the seminar series has been brewing for a while um, in my mind. Uh, and it's response to what I perceive as a bit of a gap in the national discourse about renewable energy. So we're, we're I think, all aware that the auction program for getting renewable energy onto the grid, the REI, the RE4P project has been relatively successful in adding renewable energy. But as load shedding has worsened, and with that, I'd add, as the distribution network and the state of those distribution assets has deteriorated along with the functionality of the municipal government sector, households and hospitals and businesses and schools are trying to take the energy security to their own hands. And we are seeing a significant surge in demand for particularly solar energy. Uh, there is a graph that Gaylor Montmass and Claire from TIPS has been putting on LinkedIn, which shows this, this very big surge. And um, I'm not going to show it because I saw it was in Ross's presentation, but that just, um, so it's, it's interesting to explore, you know, what is happening in these markets? Where is the solar energy going? And I think there's a gap in understanding. So firstly, where is the demand? What is the nature of the demand? Um, who is Who is asking for these products? Why? Um, with what kind of implications and what kind of innovation is happening, particularly around uh, financing. And I myself am a beneficiary. Um, you know, I thought I would have to have this huge capital outlay to buy a solar system. I don't have to because I rent it. So that for me was, you know, really, I didn't really know that there was something like this on the market before. But there's also a gap in terms of understanding the policy and legal and regulatory landscapes in particular market segments. So this is firstly a landscape that is moving very quickly. Uh, for example, the lifting and then the liberation of the NURSA licensing requirement, uh, introduction of the solar tax this year, and now the energy bounce back scheme, which Derek will talk to. And then also shifting constraints and opportunities as municipalities wake up to the possibility of you know, registration requirements and feeding tariffs. So it's a very fast moving landscape. But it is also a landscape that is differentiated. So depending on the particularities of the sector, there are different kinds of policy and legal and regulatory issues that arise. For example, in the household sector, you have to consider how these product offerings are intersecting with different kind of property relations. How does it intersect with home financing and insurance? Schools are a different ball game because there you have to think about um, dealing with the provincial departments of education and then the tenure and mandate of school governing bodies. Municipalities are very complex and exciting space and there you're in the sphere of intergovernmental relations, uh, the Municipal Finance Management Act and Treasury regulations on IPP. So I just felt there was a lot to explore um, and just to see what is actually happening, what is happening out there. So the seminar is not a kind of usual academic seminar where we present academic research and we we talk about our conceptual methods and our you know our frameworks and our methods. Um, I certainly want to acknowledge that there is much research that is happening here, including here at WITS. 
Um, you know, I've I've attended seminars which are, have been around uh, concern around how embedded generation is taking away from municipal revenues. I want to also acknowledge the work of the GCRO, the Gauteng City Region Observatory, and they recently produced a map on the justice implications of household access to water and electricity. My own research has been focused on a doctrinal level on the renewable energy laws of Southern Africa, um, and then also energy justice in its distributive procedural and recognition um, dimensions. But these, this seminar series is really taking the ivory tower to the world. Um, so rather than taking the ivory tower to the world, we've invited the world to the ivory tower. And so I've reached out to speakers who seem to me to be kind of first movers or leaders uh, in the space. And then we've also made a concerted, concerted effort to make the seminar series accessible to the public. Uh, we, you know, we've reached out to specific bodies or institutions we thought would be interested in the content. Uh, for this particular seminar, we did a really try to reach out to residents associations in Southern Africa, in South Africa, sorry. So we have quite a, a diverse and interesting participant list. And I want to invite you now, if you could please introduce yourselves in the chat and then also use the chat to make comments or suggestions or questions uh, as the speakers are speaking. I will keep a take note of what's happening in the chat. Um, and this is a, this is in the spirit of a collective energy democracy. Um, the way I'm going to run the, 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 the seminar today is to have the presenters, you know, each that they're going to go. Ross, is, Ross will go first, then Mark and then Derek, and then I will take two or three very quick burning questions after each speaker just to you know allow for participation earlier on and then when all the speakers are finished we'll also then have an additional time for discussion but in the in the meantime please use the opportunity to introduce yourselves in the chat so i'm almost done uh, before i move on to the themes uh, for the household sector i just want to give two votes of thanks uh, the first vote of thanks is to the founder of my chair the claude leon foundation uh, which enables me to do this really interesting work and for which I'm very grateful. And the second is a vote of thanks to Machte Jans van Noordwijk of the Mandela Institute, without which this also wouldn't have happened. Machte, you totally amazing. Thank you so much for helping me pull everything together. And then also Reason Sabia, who is an intern at the, at the Mandela Institute, who has assisted with the list. So turning then to the, the household sector, you know, kind of looking at the landscape, um, there's there's so many questions and themes that can arise. You know, firstly, what is the household sector? Who is actually taking advantage of renewable energy? There are many hundreds and thousands, millions of people in South Africa who do not live in a, you know, who live in informal or dwellings in unplanned settlements. Where are we seeing the demand and the uptake? And is there a possibility that the kinds of innovations and you know the innovations in the product offerings are going to have a kind of massive uptake? As, as it becomes more normalized. So, uh, you know, I think of like satellite TV dishes, um, probably going to be a situation where we're flying over South Africa and we're just seeing these solar panels everywhere. Why are people uh, investing in renewable energy? Is it energy security? Is it about saving? Is it about investment? What about standards? You know, from time to time, you see these, uh, I think the Vodacom offices, they were saying there's some fire, the solar panels were on fire. What about standards? How can we ensure that, you know, as people take this up, there is some sort of compliance that there is, you know, also for the, the integrity of the grid. What kind of options are being pursued in terms of ownership and leasing? Um, financing, are people tending to self-finance this? Are they extending existing loans? And um, what are the implications of the new energy bounce back scheme? What are the regulatory requirements uh, for grid and off-grid options? The municipal registration requirements, municipal feed-in tariffs, what are the supply chain considerations? You know, the Renewable Energy Master Plan was released recently, and although there is a section on private uptake, it's still very much in the vein of large scale utilities that are going to be taking up. You know, is there, is there any possibility? What, what are the, where are you getting your products from? And then what is the, what is the situation look down the line? What, if, what is the end of life management uh, for these panels and batteries that are going to be used up at some stage? Tax implications, the solar tax incentive, um, and then the possibility of not just um, renewable energy generation solutions, but also uh, grid grid solutions. Are, are we looking at down the line of having some kind of, you know, private grids um, and investment in that? So I think that's enough from me.
I want to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Ross Mains Shirt, and I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Ross. If I have haven't, please just correct me. Ross is the co-founder and CEO of Versify Solar. So Versify initially started in 2015 as an online marketplace for professional services. COVID lockdown forced the business, like many others, to a grinding halt, and they needed to pivot their offering in order to survive. And Versify Solar was the result of this pivot. And they are now at a point where they've harnessed five years of learnings, connections, and skill sets, which has applied them to uh, one focal category, and that is residential solar. Uh, since 2021, they have installed over 4,000 solar systems and they quickly evolved their offering to fit the requirements of one of the fastest growing sectors in the country. So without further ado, Ross, can I please hand over to you? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um pop my camera on. Um, yeah, thank you for that intro. I'm going to just share my screen to get my Prezo up and running. But uh, sorry, excuse me. Cool. Can you see that? Uh, we can. Thank you, Russ. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you very much and thank you for having me. It's a hugely exciting space that we're in. And I think, um, you know, the, the more awareness around the space and what's happening, um, the better for everybody and, and, and for the sector as a whole. So just a very quick introduction on Versify Solar and who we are. Um, the theme of my, my talk is more around the sector in general and less around us as a business. Uh, but I think just to prime the conversation and give some context as to, to who we are and the part we play in the sector, um, a, a, a quick introduction. So you made mention of it in, in the intro. Versify uh, 1.0, as we now uh, refer to it, was actually a marketplace for professional services. So we are an online-based business that connected um, everyday consumers to professional services. Um, and we were actually a reverse classifieds. That's where the name Verso Fire comes from, reverse classifieds. Um, and we, we basically um, took someone looking for a service and introduced them to those service providers, but we put the onus on those service providers to win over that business. So um, kind of like how Hippo works for insurance, but for all kind of professional services. Um, long story short, um, COVID uh, lockdowns hit in, in the early part of, of um, 2020, and we had over three and a half thousand SMEs on our, on our uh, portal um, who, like us, um, weren't able to work, and it kind of forced our hand into a pivotal persevere um, kind of mindset. And we took the decision uh, quite early on in, in 2020, around April, to um, strip out our horizontal marketplace, which had over kind of 50 categories at that point, and focus on one sole category. And the category we chose was solar. Um, it was standing out as our most popular category in 2018, 2019. Um, it's something that, that we love as an asset class and just the whole green energy revolution is something that, that myself and, and my co-founder Angus believe in wholeheartedly. Um, so it was an obvious choice for us. And the biggest barrier to entry when looking at solar independently was the cost um, and the capital outlay required um, to install a solar system. And in 2018, 2019, 2020, when we, when we kind of we're, we're getting into the solar space and launching load shedding was around. I mean, it's been around since 2008, um, but it was nowhere nearly as prevalent or, or frequent as it currently is. Um, so the, the narrative and, and our customer base at that point, the, it was a different narrative. It wasn't a load shedding solution in isolation. It was um, actually more of a cost saver and a green energy, clean, reliable kind of source of energy. Um, 
and and that's how we went to market. So our our again our, our kind of pain point that we were trying to solve was this access to solar and the, and the high kind of capital requirements um, associated with it. So you know for 150 200 thousand rand, not many people had that lying around to invest in solar. Wait for a kind of five year pay payback period and then um, and then you know, start to reap the rewards. So we went to market with a very, very open mind. Um, and we went to market with a kind of vanilla asset finance product whereby we would lend money out effectively um, and, and claw that back over a five year period. So a, a, a rent to own model. Um, the, the open mindness of that was to just kind of see where the cards fell, see what the adoption was from a proof of concept uh, point of view and take those learnings and then scale our business. Um, and it, we learned very, very quickly um, how we went to market was we would send an installer to someone's house um, get them to quote, apply that quote into a finance kind of uh, formula that we had made and then quote the, the end user, it would cost you 2,756 Rand as an example over five years. Um, after doing that 20 or 30 times, although every house was different, we, we quite quickly found pattern. Um, so we thought let's, Let's further simplify this thing. Let's let's make almost an Andicio's menu of packages. So we use the inverter size as the base of the pizza effectively, um, and then had associated kind of toppings there thereafter. So we we had a five and an eight kilowatt um, option at that stage. The twelve kilowatt three phase wasn't in existence at that stage, but that's kind of the, our central point in how we went to market. Um, we, we, although we went with a vanilla kind of rent to own proof of concept, our ambition and, and our goal was always to be an as a service. We saw the trend um, across the board and across multiple industries, obviously starting in kind of cloud computing. Um, but this, this notion of non ownership and, and rather utilization um, has been apparent in, in recent years from, you know, Netflix, you no longer need a a DVD collection, Spotify, you know, CDs and, and LPs are no longer a thing. You have access to, to an infinite supply of music for a subscription fee. And we thought, why not the same for, for energy? Um, because with ownership um, comes cost of ownership and maintenance and whatnot. So that's, that's how we went to, we went to market with a, with a rent your own um, model, but then we, we um, raised our own kind of, funding lines in order to offer a solo as a service um, model, which has been hugely adopted by our, our customer base. We actually took us a bit by surprise. We thought there would be quite a lot of education uh, and convincing around a non-ownership model. But I think the price point and the catalyst of, of load shedding um, and you know the frequency of it in, increasing hugely over the last two, three years has, has kind of uh, acted as a huge catalyst in the adoption of this as a service um, offering. And, and we, we're very glad to see it. Um, and we have some other competitors in the market who are offering similar things. Um, and I think it's just a great category job um, and in, in a service that, that the country is really crying out for. So that's a very quick intro as, as to who we are as a business. Um, and throughout the rest of the Prezo, I'm just going to kind of talk around what we are aiming to achieve, what the the industry as a whole is is leading towards and and where I believe or we believe the future is is headed and and what makes us kind of hugely excited to be a part of it. Um, so I did this little exercise internally last week in in our staff meeting to to see um, and basically this is a picture of of um, noise cancelling headphones and the question I asked the team was does anyone know how noise cancelling headphones actually work and the tech behind it and um, no one actually knew, everyone knew what noise cancelling headphones were and what the result was, but no one actually knew how they work. So the tech around noise cancelling headphones is, is actually quite interesting. Basically, all sound travels in waves. 
Um, and if you overlay, um, it's basically compression um, and expansion of air is what creates sound. Um, and if you overlay, so you invert one sound wave and overlay it against um, uh, the, the other sound wave, you get what's called destructive interference. And basically the one sound wave blocks out the other sound wave and effectively you get um, silence um, or noise cancelling. Um, it's not 100% perfect, but it works really well. And the point I'm trying to make here is I think we in a very early stage in solar and adoption of solar, and there's a lot of um, uncertainty and questions around the space as a whole, uh, a lot of buzzwords going around, a lot of people want to know what the, the tech involves and how it all works. And that's natural um, in an early phase of a technology. Although solar has been around for many, many years, um, it's only really getting mass adopted now. Uh, again, I think load shedding is acting as a catalyst in this country, but we're seeing it worldwide in, in Europe and, and the West and, and uh, large parts of Asia, Australia, the whole world is basically adopting uh, solar technology. And the point I'm trying to make here is it doesn't actually matter. There will be a, a handful of people and enthusiasts who, who want to know how it works, like they are in computer technology, like there is in kind of car enthusiasts who want to know kind of turbos and and uh, engine makeups and whatnot. But the vast majority of, of um, people who use the service or use the product don't actually care and, and neither should they. It should just work. And that's effectively what we're trying to do with Versify Solar is just to make it simple. Put it in your house, not worry about it, control it all off a, a, an easy to use um, mobile application. Uh, the settings that, that you need to control, you can control without hitting the wrong thing and changing amperages and causing all sorts of chaos in the background. It just should be simple. It just needs to work. And, you know, it's, it's just seamless. Um, and I think one of the, anyone who has solar, um, one of the, the best things about it is you have no idea when there is load shedding. It's a seamless changeover and you just carry on with your day. Um, we want to kind of further that and, and, um, and kind of, you know, make it even more simple to use. It's just going to be a, a part of your life. Um, so basically just as an industry and where we're heading with this is, as it stands now, how the grid works, um, it's it's a centralized um, kind of model whereby you have ESCOM in, in the case of South Africa who are in charge of uh, generation, transmission and distribution, kind of a state-owned entity. They control the whole, the whole, um, the whole sector. Um, the business model in itself is ESCOM and the municipalities get revenue through a consumption um, business model. So the more someone consumes, the more revenue ESCOM makes effectively. Um, the direction of the grid is one way. It flows from, from the, the power plants through the transmission lines into the end users or the homes. Um, availability is limited, as I'm sure we can all uh, appreciate in terms of, of load shedding. Um, dependency, again, another huge dependency that we have on, on, on one sole uh, state-owned entity currently, um, and the price is increasing massively. Um, you know, year on year, we're getting more and more increases kind of across the board. Um, and the beauty of what solar does and the energy internet as a whole, which I'll get into a little bit later, is it creates this world of, of a decentralized kind of network. Um, and the key differentiators here between a centralized and a decentralized um, network, obviously a lot of pieces need to come kind of together in terms of being able to feed back into the grid, et cetera, et cetera. But assuming that uh, excess power from these mini power plants on, you know, millions of homes or hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of homes effectively creates a, each home is its own mini power plant. So the business model that, that we are pushing to as a kind of smart utility um, is going to be one of consumption, but it's also one of production where people can get paid for their power. Um, if you go on holiday for a month over December and your system is producing and you're not consuming it, push it back into the grid and get paid for that. Um, and it's also a production 
that or generation that that ESCOM or the government doesn't need to generate themselves. It's it's, it's crowdfunded essentially. Uh, the direction is two ways as opposed to one way. The availability, assuming um, you know the, the the sun isn't going anywhere, is in theory unlimited and infinite. Um, dependency is a self-sufficient model, um, and the price, and this is the most exciting point, is decreasing drastically. If you look at any search kind of the cost of solar graph on Google, and you'll see some beautiful um, kind of drop-offs over the last 20, 30 years, um, and it's just a, a function of economies of scale, and as technology gets adopted, um, the price is just coming down more and more and more, and it's going to get to the point where by solar and 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 a good proxy for this is the rest of the world where load shedding doesn't necessarily exist um solar is going to be or already is um cheaper than than coal to deploy um and and fossil fuels so a solar mix will make um come in at, at parity to the grid if not better and once that happens it becomes a no-brainer from an adoption standpoint um and there's a beautiful talk by a guy by the name of Tony Sieber, who talks about the S curve of adoption. Um, and it doesn't actually matter what the technology is or how good it is. Adoption happens when it becomes economically viable and it's, it makes the most economic sense for the users. Um, you know, cars didn't overtake horses because there was a lack of horses. It was because they were cheaper to use and you didn't have to feed your car, you know, um, and, and keep it alive. So. Uh, that's where this S curve of adoption is going to come. As soon as parity is achieved with the with the national grid, solar is going to explode um, even more than than what it is currently. And we're already starting to see this adoption. And I think it's obviously a terrible place we're in, in for the economy insofar as load shedding and what it does for for our economy and our, our kind of GDP and production and whatnot. But I think we will look back in years. Um, in a few years time and, and and realize well there's kind of every cloud is a silver lining and that is a, that that load shedding is going to or it has acted as a huge catalyst for it, an adoption of renewables um and it's it's evident in in um what we're seeing currently so this graph just to to um give you a high level background just shows the the importing um of solar panels into the country. So for the whole year of 2022, we imported 5.6 billion rands worth of solar panels into the into the um, country. In Q1 this year, we did kind of 60 odd 75 percent of that. And in Q2, we we did 8.4 just in Q2 alone. So the first half of this year, we've done more than double what we did for the whole of 2022. It, there's a huge adoption happening for obvious reason. Um, but again, I think we're going to look back at this in, in a few years' time as, as, as a beautiful thing in terms of the adoption of, of the renewable sector. Another great thing around the solar industry as a whole, um, you know, we live in a world where, where um, computers are taking over, things are getting outsourced to call centers in, in Pakistan and India, and local jobs are getting lost uh, due to technology and due to, to kind of efficiencies. The beauty of solar is it's kind of localized um, requirements. So we're seeing huge job creation and there's a lot of literature around the job creation in the solar industry because you actually need to be in the place where you are installing solar. There are people putting panels on roofs, there are people working in the DB board, there are people working kind of on the commissioning, in the logistics. Um, our call centers we have in-house at Versify. We have a, a, a whole team of support staff. Um, just the value chain that is getting created through this industry is, is awesome to see in a world whereby, you know, jobs are getting cut and getting outsourced to other countries. Um, so it's hugely exciting around the job creation. And again, it's a new skill that is, that is obviously it's, it's based on, on um, kind of the electrical field. Um, but there's a lot of skills that are getting opened up and a lot of apprenticeships um, opportunities that are that are becoming apparent. And it's something that we are looking to do um, kind of in the future is almost a versify university and training um, kind of young up and coming people to, to get the required skills 
um, in order to you know, install safely compliance at, at, at the standards required. Um, so it's a hugely exciting space for, for job creation. Uh, what role can government play in this? I think Derek is going to do quite a good job in this sector, um, just in terms of what, what role government are already playing. But I just thought I'd illustrate some, some other examples from the rest of the world, which um, kind of work as a good proxy as, as to what can be achieved when, when the right initiatives and incentives are put in place. So Vietnam is a great case study. They, they basically implemented a guaranteed buyback from a feed-in tariff. So exactly what, what they're talking about in the city of Cape Town and again in, in, in the city of Joburg, whereby surplus um, production can get, can get pushed back into the grid and the government effectively pays you um, for that surplus. So what um, the Vietnam government did was they actually put a sunset clause on the 31 of December of 2020, whereby they said, we will offer you a 20 year offtake agreement and it worked out to about one rand sixty a kilowatt hour that they would pay for surplus energy, um, and it ended up being resulting in a twenty five x growth in a twelve month period. Um, and the thing that is hugely um, important to understand and, and just to see, this is slap bang in the middle of COVID, um, in the middle of the lockdowns, they managed to get this twenty five x growth, and it was all just through. Um, good government incentives. And one of the beauties of solar is its ability to be rapidly deployed, um, you know, quickly and in, in multiple places um, all at the same time. So the scale at which it can be deployed is, is kind of, um, you know, unrivaled in that regard. In terms of regulation, this is just a full disclosure, it's not a Versify install, but these things can go wrong. We're seeing a huge influx um, in demand in, in the solar industry. And people who were DSTV installers, you know, a year ago, or pool pump installers are now all of a sudden solar installers and solar experts. Um, there's a lot of fly-by nights, there's a lot of bucky brigades kind of coming into the market. And the the main issue is is evident. Like any any wrong wiring, any shortcuts can result in, in fatal results with fires breaking out, et cetera, et cetera. So we are huge, huge um, um, advocates for, for regulation. We, we want to work with local municipalities and governments in, in kind of ensuring that, that compliance is, is upheld and things are done according to standard um, because they need to be uh, for the safety of, of, of the end user. Um, and effectively, what we are trying to create is the smart utility of the future, whereby each house is, as I alluded to earlier, a, a mini power plant. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that, you know, everything is, is done according to plan, according to, to code, and that, you know, you mitigate any, any potential kind of issues down the line. Um, and basically, what, what does the future look like? And this is, this is probably the most exciting thing for for us at, at Versify Solar and what we are trying to create. But in this decentralized world, um, there's huge power in aggregation. So we believe in the shared economy, in, in reducing waste as much as possible. Um, and it's not actually all that hard to, to achieve in, in our opinion. Um, it's just about shifting loads into the right places. If you are not using power, sharing that with the rest of the grid. Um, and a rising tide raises all boats in that regard. So the more people who adopt solar, the less kind of demand there is on the national grid and, and the less kind of requirements there are for load shedding, which is effectively trying to balance supply and demand. Um, so the more kind of supply we can create in that regard um, at a cheaper cost, um, to both the government and the end user, the better for everyone. And, and what a connected smart grid um, looks like. And, and one of the beauties of, of, of uh, Africa in general is, is we have the ability to leapfrog uh, and adopt these new technologies, um, you know, so that we can, we can quite quickly get onto to smart grids where wastage is, is mitigated at all costs where people are getting paid to, if someone wants to, to um, invest in their own kind of solar system, 
um, you know, they get the, the, the reward of, of, of what that solar provides, but they also get a, a further ROI in terms of, um, you know, getting paid for their surplus energy that they're, they're not using. So that when they go to, you know, Pledenberg Bay during December, um, that energy is not sitting redundant on their roof. It's actually going into feeding the grid and they get rewarded for that. Um, so these are some of the things that we're working on is this energy internet where, where all homes are connected. There's going to be an EV in every garage in the not too distant future. The future is electric. Um, it makes complete sense that the future is electric. And um, in order for that to happen, um, there's a lot of moving parts as, as Tracy Lynn kind of um, alluded to in her opening, opening intro um from compliance from tax from government from um you know regulation uh the beauty of it is by adopting a digital first uh, energy conscious mindset i think these moving parts come together quite nicely in unison and we actually have the unique opportunity to be a world leader in this technology and the adoption thereof so that's kind of where we're coming from we're hugely excited about the space um, as a company and as a country as a whole, we, we, we all love South Africa. We've all chosen to be, uh, um, it's a country where the sun shines kind of 300 days of the year. Um, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be kind of world leaders in, in this renewable tech um, and this industry as a whole. So hugely excited and, and again, grateful to be part of a seminar like this, which is Thank sharing you, this knowledge. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Ross. Thank you so much for that comprehensive presentation. So I am sure that there are questions burning. I'm also mindful of the time. Um, so I'm going to ask that you please, if you've got questions from Ross's uh, presentation, if you can please post it in the chat. But I'd like to move on to Mark's presentation. And Mark, can we keep it? Can we cap it at um, about 18 minutes? Can I give you a, a warning when it's at 18 minutes? Of course. Because then we have enough time for the solar tax and then a little bit of discussion Ross, at the Ross, end. Ross talks too much. No, I'm joking. No, <laughs> Sorry, was, I have I have serious. that. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Ross. No, no, okay, over to you, Ross, Mark. Ross and I have, have had many, many discussions over the past uh, couple of, certainly the last couple of years. So he's a absolute leader in this area. So thank you, Ross. Um, all right, team. So thank you for having me today. Um, I'm going to quickly just introduce the business that I run within Standard Bank and then share some insights into some lending uh, and, and some other areas that, that I hope will be of interest today. So Luxie is a business uh, owned and run by Standard Bank within the personal and private banking sector of the bank. Um, and the role of, the, of this, this business is really to, to drive home efficiency as our core. So we believe that by assisting homes to reduce the, the running and managing of their homes, uh, and therefore saving money that we would hopefully be able to put more people in homes um, and and really uh, it, the the higher purpose which is aligned to the PPB personal private banking purpose of Standard Bank is that every generation needs to be better off than the past and the last generation so our role is really to try and help homes certainly with education information and insights uh, we have lots of tools. We have a, a, a tool called the Solar Score. We can go put in your address and you can get a, a score for your home. Uh, many, many others, property valuations, lots and lots of content and information and insights into um, different ways that you can reduce the, the, the cost of managing and running your home. For obvious reasons, we, we've, we've uh, spent a lot of focus and time in the energy space and the water environment. So, so water is, of course, another big challenge coming for homes. And uh, we believe that uh, we can certainly make a difference as a, you know, being owned by a bank, but also a brand that is really trying to build um, uh, uh, opportunity for homes to be more resilient to, to the challenges that we face in the market. Um, so on the financing side, um, there was uh, a lot of a lot of papers were written over the last 18 months around the opportunity for banks particularly in the funding of solar. Um, even today, um, some more announcements came out that the Standard Bank is looking to, to fund up to 300 billion rands worth of, of solar systems or solar uh, in Africa. So it really is a big part of the bank's uh, initiatives and, and energy is a big area for us to, to focus on. So, um, you know, as Ross mentioned, the component pricing dropping, um, the cost of, the cost of ESCOM production rising, uh, really sees an opportunity uh, for certainly for the sector to grow um, in a in a rapid way. Um, the 
the, the, the area of cash flow positive um, is really coming, as, as Ross has already mentioned, uh, both homes and businesses and in the, in the business and CNI world, um, it becomes a real, real big, a big deal when you can, you know, potentially reduce those those energy costs when you know big factories are are spending hundreds of thousands of rands every month. Um, and I won't go too much into the bounce back scheme as I know Derek is talking about it, but uh, we are participating in that. There's, there's still um, contractual negotiations underway, but Standard Bank will be uh, participating in the energy bounce back scheme uh, to to help uh, make uh, solar more affordable than 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 it is already becoming. So I'm sure everyone's seen this graph, but it's just you know really really depressing. It's a little bit old, but it gives you a, a very very clear view on on accumulated load shedding time uh, over the last three to four years. Um, and what we noticed is is that a lot of um, a lot of people were really before 2023 were were working out uh, this return on investment for solar and residential. So doing big, big spreadsheet calculations. Uh, putting meters on their their DB boards for 12 months so they could really understand their um, you know their consumption and and doing a, a, a hyper analysis um, that really shifted um, from the beginning of this year when ESCOM announced the permanency of load shedding uh, we and I'm sure Ross saw the same just a total flip of the switch in the mindset and the psychology of what's going on in the home so if you take it back to psychology and you think about uh, what it, what stress and anxiety was being created by the challenges homes were going through, um, and, and in every one of our homes we have different challenges. Be it the Xbox turning off halfway through a Fortnite game, or the teenage daughter can't message her boyfriend because the internet's down, creates a huge amount of anxiety in the home, um, which then create really create this this the shift of of this is not a this is not a, a nice to have any longer. This is not a return on investment. Uh, calculation. This is really about uh, you know looking after my family and and sorting my um, my house out, and that's where we saw this this massive uh, increase in 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 demand for for solar. So um, we we know and and Ross has attested to it with that customers are buying on monthly affordability um, and ensuring that they get peace of mind um, around what's what's available. Um, I won't go into the too much detail here, but specifically focus on the home loan piece. Within the standard bank world, 80% um, of customers um, are funding their solar systems via home loan readvances or access bonds. Um, and we find that, of course, this is for a home, the, a fixed financing solution where um, they can get uh, uh, lower interest rates than, say, unsecured or personal loans. Um, we encourage and excited about the, the bounce back scheme because that, that creates more affordability for customers. So that monthly payment number, which is the all important number um, can can reduce for customers who choose to own their solar system. Um, and there is, of course, a, a, a very much a balance between people wanting to rent and people wanting to own. And there are different reasons why customers may choose different different paths uh, when it comes to the ownership or the renting of solar systems. Um, and that is really something that that we've noticed in our markets and certainly within the Luxy business. Um, where we at this point offer you know, cash or home loan uh, or funded solar solutions, but certainly looking at to, to potential partners around how does the bank get closer to, to offering subscriptions as well um, within uh, the, the personal and private banking space. Um, so what we also have done is a bit of work around using satellite imagery, um, solar radiation data, to get a view on what penetration looks like, um, we haven't we haven't completed the the project, but I've got a little bit of information on one suburb in the Cape today that I'll share. Um, but essentially, what we're trying to understand is what does this penetration look like, um, and 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 for a couple of reasons, um, within the within the climate policies of of financial institutions, there are net zero uh, uh, ambitions and targets that are being set. And with the residential book, the size of Standard Banks, which is the you know the largest uh, home loan book in 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 the market, it's it's really about understanding what that emissions looks like, that emission emissions intensity emissions um, within the home loans book. Um, it's quite difficult to know and understand because in markets like the UK, um, it's mandated that every home has to have an energy certificate. But in South Africa, outside of the EBS certification, which is mostly for new builds and new homes. Um, we have seen very, very low adoption of of homes, you know, older homes getting, you know, going and getting an energy certificate through the edge certification process. 
um, it's costly firstly and 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 secondly there's no real incentive for homes to want to do so so we're trying to find alternative ways of understanding what the penetration is of residential solar within our standard bank home loan book um, and using satellite imagery and data to try and understand that um, and and for a couple of reasons as i said one is is, is how do we then target forward to say okay well it's x percent of the book has got uh, solar installed already, what does the rest of that book look like and how do we encourage and, and incentivize those customers who, who don't have a renewable energy solution to, to invest in one? And then secondly, of course, within the sustainable finance world to access uh, DFI funding and cheaper funding so that we can pass savings on to consumers, um, we need to be able to auditably prove that, um, that we have homes that are, are considered to be in a renewable space. So water and, and electricity are the two main areas. Uh, within the edge certification, as an example, um, a home that is older than five years, um, you only need to focus on e electricity consumption and water consumption as the two main areas in order to, to, to get certifications uh, done. You can't use satellite imagery to find out whether a home has um, water restrictors on their taps, of course. Um, but but satellite can give us a view on on uh, panels on roofs, uh, which then gives us some, some understanding of penetration. So so this is an example in Newlands. Uh, we did a, a, a an analysis there, um, and of the total bonded homes, Standard Bank bonded homes in Newlands, um, uh, the 179 homes, 43 of them have solar installed already. So you can see that's about a 20 odd 28 percent penetration um, in that particular uh, suburb. Um, of course, that gives us an opportunity to understand how do we incentivize those other homes within the Standard Bank book to, to uh, take up uh, uh, residential solar. Here's another example um, of some data that, that, that we've got, got access to around pre-December 2022. This is a suburb in Swanee. I'm not exactly sure which suburb, but just to give you a view, um, in this suburb, a 49% increase in the suburb of, of, of solar installations. Um, you know, within a very short space of time. So, so lots of growth and also still a significant amount of opportunity to encourage and incentivize homes um, to take up these solutions and hoping that it becomes more about um, energy parity, price parity and less about load shedding um, because that is not a sustainable model for any of us to, certainly within the business of the space, Ross would probably attest to it, you can't keep on talking about load shedding um, because it needs to move into a, a savings conversation in a, in a home efficiency conversation and of course a green one as well. Another big area of focus for us, we there is, they call it the ugly stepchild of energy, which is demand management or, or I say a typo, apologies, um, demand management um, and, and certainly uh, um, the, the, the idea of energy efficiency versus production of energy um, is something that is not doesn't get as much time in the sun as it should. Um, and geysers, for example, are just a massive drain on the grid. Um, we, we, we have about six to seven million uh, electric geysers in South Africa. And if 5% of those geysers were just managed outside of the peak area time, so that water was, those geysers were not on in say seven till nine in the morning or six till nine in the morning. And again, it's five till nine in the evening. That would eliminate an entire stage of load shedding, and that is only 150 odd thousand geysers. So the, the, these 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 electric geysers are a huge burden. Um, very often they're not managed uh, like they should be, um, left on permanently, um, and I think it's you know significant wastage of of energy um, that in the demand management space is something that we really want to focus on. Um, of course, alongside energy production. So you, we've got your supply side management in, in the demand side management world. Um, we believe that certainly water heating in the solar geysers, gas geysers, heat pumps, smart geysers um, is a really important part of, of the journey. Of course, alongside uh, heating and cooling, cooking, lighting um, and others. So, so that is a, a key part of, of why we exist, as I mentioned at the beginning, trying to help homes reduce their, their costs and by reducing consumption, we can directly impact their costs uh, going on in the home. Um, what is really interesting too is you see a lot of um, a lot of uh, behavioural change um, as solar systems go out into into the homes. It becomes a, a discussion in the home around when you should or shouldn't be turning on your dishwasher or your washing machine, and this whole uh, uh, you know, cycle that never ends is around 
reducing your usage, managing your energy usage and optimization, um, you know, the alternative and, re and renewable energy becoming maybe, you know, powering more and more of what you do on a daily daily basis. Um, and then going back through the cycle again and again, um, as Ross mentions over time, you might find that there's enough excess power in your home because you've become so efficient that maybe you can start to generate some revenues off the back of it. Um, I'll skip this slide because I know that that'll, that Derek will go into this uh, in detail, but essentially this was around um, an ex exciting government intervention that we hope is going to going to see an impact in business and in, in consumer. Um, and and lastly, uh, just a little bit around what's next and, and what we're looking at and, and seeing in the market is this price parity conversation is definitely going to become very, very real. Um, the, the unknown for us here is what ESCOM chooses to do with uh, grid connection fees. Um, I believe that uh, the city of Joburg is going to go up in some areas from about 900 Rand to about 12 or 1300 Rand grid connection fees, which essentially eliminates opportunity for some homes to actually make the savings that they hope they will, because those grid connection fees become larger and larger. Um, we don't, we don't, and haven't really got involved in offering uh, off-grid solar solutions to customers. All of them have been grid-tied, and with a grid-tied solution, it then becomes uh, a challenge with with increasing grid fees. Um, that is difficult for certainly for customers to to work out whether they are break-even or or you know at parity. Um, the question and unknown for us still right now is is will savings fuel demand increase just like load shedding fuel demand was really really big it is reducing we've seen a, a, a cooling off of demand um, over the last last 30 to 60 days um, and i think that's something that's that should be considered um, the the sell back opportunity in carbon credit markets the issue with carbon credits is that they need to aggregate at at large scale so with the decentralized energy um future um, and and businesses who do aggregate uh, demand um, there is an opportunity to trade those carbon market credits in partnership with with homeowners so we do believe that that um, businesses who do, do deploy systems in onto homes um, you know should be completely open and transparent with the customer so that they know that over time there could be an opportunity to generate revenue from excess power and or generate revenue from carbon credits. Um, both of those could be in partnership with the home where there's a revenue share uh, with the business and, and the homeowner themselves. Um, and a kind of a funny thing around the full circle, currently we buy power by the kilowatt hour uh, from ESCOM. Um, Ross's innovation is of course into the subscription world where you're buy, paying a monthly subscription. Um, and the question is, do we go back to kilowatt hour unit purchasing of green power? And 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 is it is it economically viable? Maybe in multi-dwelling homes, it's it's viable. Uh, sectional title or, or clusters where where the the body corporate often owns the the common ground, the common land, which is the the roof as well. Um, and power purchase agreements for homes um, could certainly become something that that is that is significant. Um, and micro gridding um, in in communities partnering with corporates in certain areas could be an opportunity as well. Um, where corporate in the area, maybe mining or factory businesses, uh, provide uh, excess power to to those communities in the nearby areas, specifically where there aren't grid ties or grid connections uh, available for uh, for those homes. Um, so yeah, I think I, I think I'm on time. 17 minutes, 16 and a half minutes. So I'll I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. <Jessica. laughs> Thanks, Mark, for a, a a very interesting presentation. So while Derek is getting ready, I just want to note two questions in the chat so long, which you and uh, Ross can think about in the meantime. Uh, the first is from Julia, and she asks, can you share any information on the types of homes and areas that mostly have solar? So, for example, by house value, and would be interesting to see what level of income makes it viable to have a private system. And then secondly, um, firstly, a compliment to compelling and informative presentations. This is from Timber Middleman. Uh, I would like to hear from both speakers on how municipalities can cope with the lost revenue as all those who can afford to pay are reducing grid consumption, but thereby also revenues. How are municipalities going to afford to provide power to the poor, power to the poor who can't access solar either? And I think that really is, I mean, I know the Vitz community will be really interested in that 
uh, you know, what are the justice implications of these of these solutions that are being rolled out? Thank you, Mark. Can that I, was fantastic. Okay, sure. No, oh, we can I think let's, just, let's, have, let's have yeah. Derek. So you think about it for the meantime, and then we'll have Derek, and then we'll have space for more questions as well. Derek, over to you. Thanks, Tracy, and thanks, Mark, and thanks, Ross. Those are, those are great. When, when Tracy asked me to speak for 20 minutes on um, tax incentives and government initiatives in the household sector, I was worried I didn't have anything more than about two minutes to speak about because, to be honest, it's not nearly enough, um, certainly by my by my sense. Um, but I, uh, I have done it and I'll, I'll run through it now. I'm going to quickly share my screen. I assume everyone can um, can see that. Is that OK, Trace? That's cool. Thanks, Derek. Perfect. Thanks. OK, so so we, we're focusing largely on the household sector. And so um, it is important for us to note that there are incentives and initiatives focused around business. Um, and, and as both speakers had, had already alluded to, the decision around um, deregulation in this market space has really profound impacts and the knock-on effects are quite um, are, 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 are quite meaningful in a very short space of time, as, as Ross's presentation on, on what happened in Vietnam uh, is an example of that. And so a little bit of deregulation and a little bit of creativity can actually create um, is spawn out a whole host of different opportunities, industries, job opportunities. And while, yes, there are some losses to the fiscus and to the, the, the municipalities in terms of energy consumption, um, there are also other benefits that 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 are, are, are traded off for that. So uh, government regulation plays such an important part in terms of generating um, interest in this particular space. And, and, and government has, in terms of um, the, the household sector, really come up with two uh, that I'll, I'll be touching on today. The first is the solar PV panel tax incentive, and the second is the energy balance back loan guarantee scheme, which Mark touched on as well, and I'll speak to that in a little bit more detail. But the solar panel tax incentive is largely for individuals. Um, it doesn't apply to businesses. Businesses are actually dealt with under Section 12B of the Income Tax Act, and there are benefits there, which we'll talk about potentially in another seminar. Um, but the benefits that have been granted to companies and businesses um, are, are certainly far more extensive than they were in relation to individuals. And so in this context, uh, you know, it's disappointing to see that government has only given us a very small incentive. And I'll talk about what that looks like um, in, in a moment. But the, the objective here is to encourage households to invest in clean, clean electricity generation capacity for purposes of supplementing the grid supply. Now, if you look at the wording around um, the, the, uh, the uh, practice notes which have been issued by uh, SARS in relation to this particular incentive, the wording talks around generation capacity and supplementing grid supply. And so it talks largely to this prospect of building out um, um, a, a generation capacity that goes ultimately will find its way back into the grid at some time. Um, and so the incentive is actually shaped around that objective. And we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail uh, because I think it's really important to indicate as by way of sort of setting some bright beacons as to where I think this incentive is going to go and where the regulatory environment is going to be headed, because we all know ultimately it's going to be to feeding back into the grid. So uh, we'll touch on that now. But this is for individuals and individuals who are registered for personal income tax can claim a rebate on their tax liability. Uh, it's not the same for business, as I indicated. So the uh, the, the general methodology is you get a rebate of um, of value of 25% of the cost of new and unused uh, PV panels, up to a maximum of 15,000 Rand per individual. So um, a couple of really important points, new and unused, I'll touch on that as well, and then the maximum of 15,000. So in any given year, you can only really get a 15,000 Rand rebate. And that assumes that uh, you're paying 60,000 Rand, because if you pay anything over 60,000 Rand, you're still going to be capped at the 15,000. So I've given an example of two scenarios of of where you can where you can get the rebate. Uh, the first is where a person buys ten solar PV panels at a cost of four thousand rand per panel. Uh, Twenty five percent of that is ten thousand. It's lower than the fifteen thousand max, so you get the ten thousand back. Um, the other is an example of where you spend eighty thousand uh, on 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 twenty solar PV panels. 
uh, you'll get the full 15,000 because 25% uh, of the spend equals 20,000 rand. So uh, that 15,000 is the top end. So this is really where the rubber meets the road. So how do you how do you qualify for this? And there are some technical points which may be worth pointing out, uh, but it's only new and unused solar PV panels uh, that qualify. And, and and this is in order to ensure that they're not paying or not giving rebates for infrastructure which was set up prior to 1 March 2023. This is only marginal and additions. Uh, to the economy post 1 March 2023. So if there's a new or unused solar PV panel which comes into use um, in the next year, and we'll talk about the time frame, then that um, then that 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 serves to qualify for purposes of this this tax rebate. So the other requirement is it must be part of a new installation or an ex extension of an existing installation. The PV panels must meet a minimum capacity requirement. Um, and other components don't qualify. This talks to this question of energy generation. So things like uh, inverters and the like don't qualify for this uh, rebate simply because they're not energy generators in the same sense that solar panels are. And uh, all they do is reduce demand. They don't create, uh, they're not in, uh, energy generators of, in, in and of their own right. And so those generally can't be fed back into the grid. And so I think that's why, partly the reason why that was disqualified. Um, the installation has to be improved. There must be a certificate of compliance. And the, and the PV panels must form part of a system that's connected to the main distribution of the private residence. Again, here's some of this indication that what they really want to do is they want to try and force people ultimately at some point in the future to feed this generating capacity back into the grid. It's no point having a cottage at your home where you have solar PV panels and you just have an isolated um, closed unit there. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't qualify for the uh, for the rebate and simply because I think the intention is to ultimately draw that power that excess power back into the grid. This is only going to be available for one year. So up until the end of February next year, uh, I have a suspicion it's obviously going to be extended, not only because I think um, it's going to prove to be quite successful, but because um, the the bounce back uh, loan guarantee scheme actually goes into into August of next year. So because they intended to dovetail one another, it stands to reason that they should run the same kind of duration, which isn't the case at the moment. So I suspect that um, February next year after the budget speech, uh, we'll probably see an extension of this of some in some form or another. So how do you claim for this incentive? Well, you need a VAT invoice. And it's got to specifically itemize your solar PV panel. So on your VAT invoice, it has to say, this is for solar PV panels, and, and, and you're going to have to show a proof of payment for that. Um, if you don't show your solar PV panel separately in the VAT invoice, it's going to be disallowed. Uh, you have to give a certificate of compliance and uh, showing that they were brought into use for the first time. So that's your, your, your compliance officer who signs that, uh, will, will testify to that in that compliance certificate. And they have to come into uh, it brought into use for the first time during this period that the incentive is available. And if that incentive is extended, then perhaps that would apply then too. If you're somebody earning a salary and, and you pay PIE and you get an RP5, then you can just simply include it as a rebate in your in your tax return during your filing season, which uh, is currently underway at the moment for those of you um, who, who have put in your tax your, your tax returns for the year. Provisional tax uh, payers, you can do it um, as a provisional or final filing, so that uh, doesn't inhibit you there. So what about diesel generators, inverters, batteries, and, and other installation costs? Well, I touched on it briefly. Diesel generators are considered to be backup power, and so they're deemed not suitable, even though they can feed back into the grid. Um, they are not predictable and they require additional maintenance and other items. So they generally speaking don't um, don't meet the requirements for government for the incentive. In addition, there's obviously the environmental issues uh, around the fuel demand and, and, and other climate objectives around running diesel generators. Um, in addition, what a lot of people don't refer to when they speak about the environmental impacts is the, the noise and the sound impacts of diesel generators. Uh, you know, you only have to um, um, listen in your neighborhood in the evenings uh, to know. So these are the kinds of things which I think government wants to try and steer away from. Um, inverters and batteries are capable of being used without solar panels, but they don't offer this additional generating capacity to the system. And so uh, the, this PV panel initiative is really trying to 
um, is to to generate as much capacity within a limited budget uh, for the rebate. So the sense from um, the, the the treasury in terms of the the the, the conversation notes which they've they've issued on this is really to suggest that um, much of the generating capacity that they can generate with the budget that they have available is met through the solar imperative and so that's why um, they've gone this route. Additionally, uh, I make the note the installation costs are excluded because it's not a cost directly to generation. So clearly there's this uh, this focus on, on, on generation going forward which seems to suggest uh, in future at some point that this is going to go back into the grid. So uh, rental homes and cohabitation is a really important conversation and a lot of people don't realize this, but even if you put a solar installation in um, in a house that you're renting, you can still claim this, this incentive because it's not linked to ownership of the house. It's only linked to the panel itself. And so the person who pays for that solar panel can claim the rebate. Uh, as long as it meets all those other requirements that we spoke about, it's being um, connected to the main distribution, certificate of compliance, et cetera, et cetera. So here's a really interesting um, tax uh, opportunity is that if you're having a solar installation put in and you're married or you're cohabiting with a partner, if you decide um, to, to split the cost of the solar PV panels into two separate invoices, each of you will theoretically be entitled to claim a maximum rebate of 15,000 Rand because it's not limited to a dwelling or it's not limited um, to, a, uh, it's, it's, it's not limited to an installation. It's actually li limited per person. So if a person is buying solar PV panels and they're linked into an installation, they get the benefit of the rebate. So that's quite a smart way. Maybe you want to think about that um, in terms of, you know how you go about marketing your products or or, or or discussing these opportunities with your potential clients and and colleagues body corporates and sectional titles much more complex um currently the the proposed uh, the the wording in the in the in the um, general law amendment the, the the taxation law amendment act doesn't give enough scope for body corporates and sectional titles to be able to really leverage off this which is hugely disappointing just goes to show that not enough, not enough thought was given to this at the time. Uh, it's almost as if they just dipped their toe in the water to feel the temperature because the body corporates um, ought to be eligible for some kind of microgridding, as, as um, Mark was re re referencing. Uh, body corporates aren't eligible because we're not sure how to allocate the rebate amongst individuals in a body corporate. Who's really getting the benefit? Who's spending the money? How are you using it? How do you allocate the cost, et cetera? So this needs some thought, but certainly uh, it looks as though this is something that will be addressed in future versions of this legislation. So I'm expecting in February next year after the budget speech that this incentive will be extended, uh, certainly by another year at least. Um, and in there, there will probably be some um, additional provisions relating to body corporates and sectional titles possibly. So I think that's something to be to be looked out for. There's no recoupment on the sale of the house. So if you sell your house with a solar PV installation in it where you have claimed a rebate, you don't have to repay some of that back. The only time there's a clawback is if you sell the panels themselves within a year after they were first brought into use. And that's because there's a there's a tax year cycle. You've got to move through that tax year. You've received the rebate. If you receive the rebate and then you go ahead and you sell those assets, um, then there's going to be a clawback on that. The government wants you to invest and not trade in solar panels. So uh, that's largely where that goes. Uh, energy bounce back loan guarantee scheme. Um, this applies to both small businesses and households and it's available um, to both. Uh, the intention here is that the government wanted to create some kind of a safety net for the market to be able to allow people to go into the market and find um, funding for uh, solar installations or renewable energy installations. And what they've done is they've come up with this idea that says the first 20% of any loss we'll carry. And so what they've done is they've gone into the marketplace and they've spoken to commercial banks and lending houses. Um, and they've said, look, if you want to lend out 100 Rand for a solar project, we'll underwrite 20 of that and we'll give you the 20 uh, as a first loss. So in essence, what happens is that if you default on that 
uh, National Treasury or the Reserve Bank will step in on that 20% first loss. So the intention here is to be able to try and give you the opportunity to go and raise the capital you need to fight the unreliable power supply on, on small businesses and households. So the intention is that this will produce a thousand megawatts of additional generation capacity during the next 12 months and, and try and ease the burden on, on households and small businesses um, um, when it comes to load shedding. The intention is that this will dovetail the solar PV panel tax incentives. Uh, those tax incentives, like I say, are, are, are quite marginal, are quite limited. Uh, but certainly, if you were to fund a, a a solar installation at your house, and you would be able to get a decent um, a financing package, you could um, you could theoretically negotiate much better terms with your bank than you could otherwise in other circumstances because it's underwritten to some extent by the government. This is now only running till 30 August 2024. That's certainly um, where um, the Treasury uh, sees this running to. They'll probably extend it as well. And as I explained earlier, I think the solar PV panel and this energy bounce back loan guarantee scheme should dovetail, it should run hand in hand. Um, so in terms of this loan guarantee scheme, we're only dealing here. There are three different mechanisms that the government has um, that has adopted. There's rooftop solars for uh, energy supply companies. There's uh, working capital loans for rooftop su solar supply chain businesses. Those are all included in the uh, in the the energy bounce back loan guarantee scheme. But we're talking today specifically about SMEs and household investment because uh, our point of conversation today is on the household sector. So largely in that context. So how does it work? So um, if uh, if a, if a household requires a rooftop solar generated energy, what they will do, um, you'll be able to go to the bank and say, you know, I want to be able to to put something on my roof. Now the loan will cover more than just the panel, which is what what the 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 the, the solar panel, uh, the PV panel incentive from the receiver of revenue. That's what that covers. It's just solar panels. But in this context, it, it, it actually applies to all of the equipments and components making up your, your rooftop solar generation plan. So National Treasury has now given a guarantee to a commercial bank for an amount and they charge a repo rate to the bank plus a 0.5% a once off charge. Uh, the bank will then go and lend out the full amount to the individual at, a, at a, a, an interest rate which is capped at repo plus 6%. Um, and I think Mark, uh, uh, he translated that into, into a prime number, I think it was prime plus two and a half, I think. Um, and then what happens is that the risk on the default um, on the bank is only four times that amount, because if the individual doesn't pay that back, the first 20% will be carried by the Reserve Bank. Um, interestingly, and this is on the next slide, we'll talk about who qualifies. Participating banks are required to cede any loans under the scheme to the Reserve Bank as security for that 20%. So if you've taken out a 100 Rand loan and you defaulted on that 100 Rand loan, um, the, um, the, the, the bank could theoretically only come after you for the 80%, but uh, the, full, the, the full loan is actually ceded to the Reserve Bank as security. Certainly that's the plan. Uh, as Mark was saying, there's some negotiations underway, but certainly the plan is that that loan will be ceded. Someone's going to come knocking on your door. It's either going to be your bank or it's going to be the Reserve Bank. Uh, either way, um, someone's going to come knocking on the door. So it's not really um, a um, it's not a get out, get out of jail free card. All it does is it, it changes your cost of lending. So it just makes it easier for you to facilitate a loan for that for that solar project at home. So um, any household um, can borrow under this energy bounce back loan guarantee scheme and it's capped at 300,000 Rand maximum loan for a roof rooftop solar system. Your banks will apply their ordinary credit rating criteria and they'll vet you uh, or any client in relation to the risk as they see it uh, and they'll price it subject to the cap set by the Reserve Bank. Um, you, you can still continue to claim a solar PV panel incentive from, from the, 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 the receiver of revenue uh, because it's intended to be complementary. And as I say, just be careful, uh, just because the uh, Reserve Bank is underwriting, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be responsible for that 20%. That 20% will find its way uh, back to you at some point. 
that um, is where I think I'm going to stop there. I know that I only had 20 minutes, but I rushed through it in the hope that I would make it for time. So, Trace, um, give you some time for questions. It was a bit more than two minutes. <laughs> a little bit more than two minutes, not much though. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. That was brilliant. With a, a fantastic tax tip there right in the middle about spouses and solar panels, which is why you need to go to Addison for tax. Yeah. Um, OK, so we had those two questions earlier. I'm now going to let anybody. Uh, so there's a third one. Uh, Lauren Nell has asked about responsibility around the waste. You know, we we kind of in this these early stages. Um, but is anyone thinking about where all the solar panel waste and inverter waste and battery waste, and but then also opportunities down the line? I mean, I, I have also encountered industries that were their businesses to make batteries last longer. So let's have those three questions and. Any of you, Derek, um, Mark, and Ross, can step in, and then we'll take another round after that. Great, Tracy. Uh, I think I'll do the first one, if that's all right. Uh, it's Julia's question around uh, home values and sizes, etc. Thank you. Um, so, so yeah, just for the purpose of the guys who haven't seen the chat, the question is uh, information around types of homes, areas that mostly have solar. Uh, by house value, uh, would be interesting to see what level of income makes it viable to have a private system. So um, I can speak to that from a, from what we've seen within within our space. Um, typically, um, we are uh, in the area of of around 155 to 165,000 Rand per solar system that is being deployed. And it's in the the the, the high income market. Um, the, the the value of the homes um, we 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 don't think that 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 customers should should be you know borrowing you know more than ten percent of the value of their home in order or you know borrowing uh, a re advance amount of money for the solar system. So so the the sad state of affairs, to be honest, is that we don't have a solve for the for the entire market, um, which is a big challenge. And I think you know certainly from an affordability perspective, we really want to to service those customers who who do have a uh, a smaller house, maybe a, a house to the value of 800,000 to one and a half million. Really, really important that we find those answers. But what's really key, though, is that we can't compromise on the quality of the systems and the equipment that gets deployed. Um, because you can't have a situation where someone borrows money for something that doesn't, that's that's of, of lower quality. Um, and therefore, um, it stops working after a few years. Last point on this is that when customers do take a re-advance on their on their home loan, we encourage them to pay the portion down that they've taken for the solar to a maximum of 10 years. Um, the, the systems will last north of 10 years, um, but we encourage them not to not to pay over 20 years. We just think it would be um, a, a smarter move, but especially because you are seeing a, a deferral of your income. You're seeing you're seeing your ESCOM bill drop um, or your city power bill drop. So. In, to to service that that portion of the loan slightly faster in order to to pay off that solar system as quick as possible. Thank you, yeah, thank just, you, Mark. Just, Kevin just Ross. To add, sorry, just to add to that, the way the way we've kind of thought about it, um, we we in the same kind of boat as as Mark and Luxi. We've done that by design. We've obviously needed to attract further funding, and we need a good kind of credit performing book. Um, but the the long-term kind of goal and, and where we see this going is once parity is achieved it, it becomes cheaper than what your utility would be so so you actually have a bigger share of wallet when you have solar than when you don't have solar and once that's achieved it opens up kind of the entire market assuming someone can afford to pay their utility bill they should be able to afford to pay their solar bill and that's kind of how we're looking at this kind of solar as a service utility play um, is to get it to a point where where it's actually cheaper to have solar than without it, and therefore it should be able to kind of make it affordable to anyone who can afford to pay their their electricity bill. Um, Thank you. Does anybody want to tackle the waste question? Yeah, I can jump in there quickly. So basically, the the how it works is the distributors um, hold that responsibility. So they they pay a levy and a tax uh, for every battery. Uh, or panels sold, and it's their resp responsibility to to discard of that and and recycle it. Um, I'll get a bit more info on that. At who you can and you can share it um, directly with 
with the the listeners um but yeah the 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 people who you buy it from or who we buy it from the the importers effectively pay a pay a levy um in order to to um accommodate the the recycling um down the line okay interesting um and there was also a question in the chat about a list of sort of approved approved installers approved suppliers which i think was answered I did see an yeah, answer. Yeah, did answer that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I think we have around a time for one more round. Um, there's one, anybody there's have a, one a burning question? Yes. So yes. There's one more question. What are we going to do about municipalities? So yeah, the way I think about this is um, through these microgrids and mini grids and this this energy internet where things are connected. Um, the way. And I think Eskom are, are kind of getting ahead of this by by splitting it up into generation, transmission, and distribution. But if you if you parallel it to the fiber space, as an example, you have a a Vumital, um, and a Dark Fiber Africa um, who kind of laid the infrastructure, so they own the rails, um, so they are the, the transmission lines in this analogy. And then you get ISPs like Cool Idea, uh, Web Africa, et cetera, et cetera, who are in charge of the distribution and collection of revenue. And Vumital, let's just say they have 100,000 customers with Cool Ideas as the ISP. They charge Cool Ideas for 100,000 customers. Whether Cool Ideas collect on 99,000, 100,000, 90,000, it doesn't matter. Um, so Vumital get paid regardless. And that's the way I think how this, this, this kind of smart utility is going to work is the municipalities and, and ESCOM in general will own the the rails on which electricity flows, um, but almost privatize the, the collection um, of revenue and they can make a, a levy or a tax basically for every rand that's sold, um, you know, they make, it, they make a tax on it. So their tax goes towards maintaining those rails. Um, and the beauty of it is they get automatic arbitrage. So they, they, they can, they buy at uh, one rand a kilowatt hour and sell it at three rand a kilowatt hour. They make two rand just by managing that transaction. And that's where I think government needs to be a bit smarter um, and, and not keep raising tariffs to, to try and claw back revenue, but actually work with people who, who have the, the capital to invest in solar um, pay them a, 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 a piece, but make a markup when they on sell that onto someone else and just get those economies working. It's the same way as private healthcare, private schooling, private security. It's the same kind of methodology. The, 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 the more adoption in these private spaces, almost a less resource drain on, on the state-owned entities and the municipalities, in theory. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, thank you, um, Russ. So we've got two more questions. Does the solar system increase the property value once installed? And then what is the estimated timeline for opening up the grid to an energy market? Is this in the government or utility strategic plans? And I'm not sure what you mean there, if you mean by opening up the grid to private investment, um, um, Ms. Yen. Uh, and then is there a question, is there a tax question? I want to give Derek a question as well. Can't even get off Scott three. <laughs> Well, while while someone thinks of a tax one, I'll I'll answer Bridget's question okay. on property valuation. So so we have we have had quite a few conversations with the bond originators, the mortgage originators, uh, better bond, Uber, and the like. Um, and what they're seeing is an interesting pattern. They're seeing, you know, we've heard, you know, I don't have uh, the statistics um, in great detail, but we've heard two to three percent, which is which is doesn't really mean much. Um, because because it's really the uh, depending on the value of the instant of the solar installation that you put in. If you've got a 10 million rand home and you're putting putting in a 100 thousand rand system, it's not going to be a two to three percent on a 10 million rand home valuation. What's more important though the, that they're seeing is sellability of homes and and the ability for homes to hold their value. Um, so a typical example, there's two homes on the market for two million rand each, one's got solar, the other one doesn't. Um, the one with solar is gonna get sold first and it's gonna most likely get its asking price um, because the other customer buying the other home knows that they're still gonna have to invest in some, some type of energy uh, and or water backup solution, um, which is unfortunately and sadly becoming almost a have to have um, uh, some kind of uh, independence around water and, and energy for, for homes. 
um, as we get inconsistent supply, which will most likely continue as a trend. OK, thank you. And then does anybody want to climb in on the trading question? Yeah, so they, they have opened it up already in Cape Town. Um, it's, you've actually been able to sell electricity into the grid in Cape Town for, for a few years now. The main issue um, there is it's twofold. One, you need what's called a bi-directional meter in order to do that. So you need a, a special meter. Um, and the second is the rate at which they buy your electricity for. So a three-phase bi-directional meter in Cape Town can cost anything between 10 and 14,000 Rand just for the meter. And it's going to something that people don't don't always consider is it's it's only really your surplus energy that you can sell so if your system can produce 25 kilowatts a day as an example you know you're only really selling maybe five kilowatts a day and even if they're buying it at one rand a kilowatt hour that's five rand a day 150 rand a month you know it's going to take you 100 months just to pay back the meter um let alone get any kind of roi on it so until such time as that meter uh, drops um, drastically, and, and we actually in, in chats with, with a couple of, of metering companies that believe they can deploy these meters at under a thousand rand, then it starts to make sense. And the, the amount that, that the, the government are willing to pay or the municipality are willing to pay for your excess needs to also make sense. Um, I do think that they are cottoning onto it. It is um, kind of standard worldwide for the ability to sell back into the grid. It does open up some complications in terms of grid balancing and and keeping the grid in frequency. So it's not as simple as just opening up the, the taps. Um, but it does look like there are steps in the right direction in that regard. Um, and in order for this, this energy internet to work and for ESCOM to remain relevant, they're going to have to do that. They're, they're, they're going to have no choice because if they keep resisting and, and keep raising prices, the irony is they're just digging their own grave um, and the people who can afford to pay them um, are going to go kind of off grid and independent. Um, so I think I think the rubber is going to hit the road for them quite soon and they're going to have to compromise on on kind of relaxing some things. And, and the bounce back scheme is a good indication that they are thinking about these things and these incentives. OK, brilliant. We have one minute left. So thank you. You've been amazing speakers. Um, I think there have been lots of questions raised. Some of these questions I do believe will be answered in the later in the later seminars. So Timber has been saying, what about the poor? What about the poor? Join us next week for Community Grids and join us for the final seminar where we speak to Des Williams about Green Shares, a scheme for investment in renewable power boxes. So there are going to be questions answered down the line. Please join us for the seminars later on. But otherwise, thank you all. It's been an amazing, uh, very informative session and I enjoy the rest of your day. And we will make these slides available and the recordings available. Thanks all. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.